This episode of Inside EMS is brought to you by Lexapol, the experts in policy, training, wellness support, and grants assistance for first responders and government leaders. To learn more, visit lexapol.com. That's L-E-X-I-P-O-L.com. Hello and welcome back to Inside EMS. Yes, it's me, no Sevalero again. He's still in distant lands doing something exciting. I'm Rob Lawrence. I jumped over from my own podcast, uh, the EMS One Stop, to uh, be here with uh, my co-host, or should I say Chris's co-host, Kelly Grayson. How are you doing, man? I'm good, man. I'm uh I'm at the uh, at a sci-fi and literary con this weekend, so that's that's pretty awesome. Uh, I'm going to be signing books and talking about the craft of of writing, uh, and it's always good to to get out and recharge my batteries and and commune with fellow geeks. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to that. Wonderful. Now we are doing this podcast in a timely manner because next mm-hmm. week is Lexapol's whole uh, e- uh, wellness week across all of the verticals. So Police One, Fire Rescue One, and EMS One are running uh, wellness weeks uh, with their obviously their own presenters and their own content. But obviously, it's all towards first responder, public safety, wellness. And so we've timed our guests to coincide with a kickoff for Wellness Week, uh, Kelly. So why don't you bring them in? We've got a uh, we've got a couple of great guests this week. We've got a uh, we've got a representative of EMS Gives Life and a representative from the Code Green campaign. And guys, I will let you, starting with you, Christine, introduce yourselves and tell our listeners what uh what is uh, EMS Gives Life all about. And then then Ra, uh, RJ, you can take it out. Sounds good. Thank you. Uh, happy to be here, um, especially in anticipation of Wellness Week coming up. So I'm the executive director of EMS Gives Life. Um, My name is Christine Fichter. And EMS Gives Life is based in Massachusetts, but we are a national nonprofit and we support living organ donation in the EMS first responder community. So um, that kind of takes three uh, channels. One is uh, any first responder who wants to be a living organ donor we help them um, go through that process so they don't have to go through it alone. It's a little bit complicated, but very doable. The second is that we work with first responders who need a living organ donor. And uh, we have four current searches right now for um, three um, people who are looking for kidney donors and one liver. And uh, we also sort of have another one in the wings who's uh, I think think gonna get um, matched with somebody soon. So we're excited about that. Um, so we work um, promoting their searches um, and trying to bring awareness to the need, um, both broadly and for them personally, and try to um, help people sign up to potential be potential donors. And then the third thing we do is we work with EMS uh, and first responder employers. So often employers want to help their employee go through this process, whether they're the donor or the recipient. Uh, and it's a little bit challenging to navigate. So we want to share what we've learned through the process and help that go smoothly. Awesome. And and RJ, tell us about uh tell us about Code Green campaign. Sure. So I'm RJ Morrison. I'm from the Code Green campaign. I'm the uh, chief financial. I'm the treasurer for the organization. Uh, similarly, we are a nationwide nonprofit organization. Uh, based out of the state of Washington, uh, but I'm actually in California uh, with other members uh, across the state, uh, the United States. Uh, our focus is more of the the stigma related to mental health for e- EMS providers, and from breaking the mold of the old days of when uh, you know it was not okay to be upset after something, to understanding that it is a an actual there is actual effect and there's cause and effect to uh, the job that we do uh, and our, our our push is to get more of the organizations these uh, corporations to support their staff in different in wellness and it not it's not just a matter of mental health wellness there's also other parts that go with it so there's family situation there's financial wellness all these things all tie in together which will you know ultimately benefit you know, a corporation when reduce sick time uh, from people, reduce injuries, fatigue, things like that. So that is our our, our main focus to to improve the, the overall well being of the EMS provider. So it's uh, it's great because we've got body and soul here. So that's uh, that's that's pretty exactly. cool. But uh, Christine, take us back to your origin story, though. And uh, of course, uh, this 
kind of started when one of the employees of Pro EMS went off and did this amazing thing. And what was that amazing thing? Uh, we're talking about Will Lindbergh, and he was a paramedic at Pro EMS at the time. And he decided um, after encountering a patient that reminded him of his father who passed away young, his patient had was in um, end stage liver disease and talked about needing a liver donor and it moved Will. And he went home and researched it um, and decided I'm going to be a liver donor. And he didn't tell anybody um, kind of just before he was going to have surgery. He said, oh, you know, boss, I kind of need some time off. And he was like, yeah, sure. What do you need? And uh, he said, oh, I'm going to donate a portion of my liver to a stranger. And, you know, so that was, you know, um, the, the thought was, who does that? That's amazing. Um, and so uh, he did. He went ahead. Um, and at the time, he didn't know. He knew it was a pediatric patient, but he didn't know who. Uh, and this was in middle of 2020. And then fast forward, he, he heals. He does well. He's back to work. Um, and fast forward to Thanksgiving 2020. And Will... And his recipient, um, a three-year-old boy, and his parents wind up on Good Morning America, Good Morning America together on Thanksgiving morning, um, when everybody's tuning into the parade, and 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 it's it's November 2020, so we're all home, and uh, and it's just amazing to watch. I don't care how many times I watch it; it brings a tear to my eye. Um, there's this very adorable, healthy boy and then there's will and they didn't know they were going to meet him he knew that that um they were there but they didn't know he was here they he, they thought he was just going to tell the story and then there's will on the camera and it was amazing um but it sparked a lot of conversation about first of all who knew you could donate a portion of your liver many of us don't um and that the portion of your liver you donate grows back in full size and functionality in a short period of time but then the other discussions isn't that amazing? Um, yeah. So most of us know about starfish, but we don't know about livers. Um, <laughs> and it and the portion you donate grows to full size and functionality in the recipient, which is also amazing. Um, but the other thing it sparked was a whole lot of conversation about I would do that if. And then there was all the talk about the obstacles. I wouldn't know how to do it. Um, how do I take leave? Um, you know what? How do I get reimbursed for costs? I, I can't afford to do that. Um, and Will really did it on his own, but we started talking about ways that it made it more accessible and recognizing that um, EMS uh, providers, you know, they're the people who run towards a crisis. All first responders run towards a crisis when other people are running away. And this is a public health crisis. And so we thought that this really could be a community that could get behind becoming living organ donors, which has been true. Um, we've had so much great response. But um, the other thing we've learned along the way is this is also a community that has a very hard time asking for help. And I, you know, I think uh, it fits very much with what RJ is doing and Co Green campaign. Um, they don't want to ask for help. They want to sit silently. They're used to being the helpers. Um, it's very awkward to ask for someone to donate a, your, a kidney. Um, and so often immediate family and close friends are not matches or can't be donors for uh, medical reasons. So um, we realized that the donor searches were equally important. So, so I'll do a call to, oh, sorry, Kelly, dig one. No, that, that, that's amazing. And, and, and uh, EMS Give Life is, uh, was just brought to my attention and, and I applaud your, your, uh, your zeal uh, in in approaching this. I'm a registered organ donor myself, but I did not know until you just told me that uh, as a living organ donor, uh, mm -hmm. my uh, my donated portion of my liver can grow back. Uh, I still hesitate whether I'd actually donate part of my liver. I, um, I think it's it's been a, a bit seasoned by uh, 30 years of uh, <laughs> EMS conferences and hotel bars. <laughs> then again, you might say, you know, it's uh, I've shown my liver who's boss, so it, it should be able to withstand pretty much anything. Um, but, but you uh, probably but that's come amazing. with a spare kidney, so. This, this is true. And I am a registered organ donor. And uh, my philosophy has always been when uh, when I pass from this earth, uh, everything that cannot be, uh, that can be used should be, uh, and then and, and cremate and uh, scatter the rest uh, and, and say nice things about me at my wake. Now, RJ, in 
Uh, the Code Green campaign uh, has long been a favorite of ours at, at Inside EMS. We were around when you guys got started. I was privileged to be one of the first, uh, uh, one of the, the original board members of the Code Green campaign. And the 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 aim of, of crowdsourcing peer support and to, to erase the stigma of mental illness in, in among uh, healthcare and public safety providers is one that we fully support. Um, what kind of initiatives has the, uh, uh, I had to, to, uh, bow out of my board member position, uh, some years back because, uh, it, it, uh, I, I did not have the time to devote to it that it deserved. So fill me in. What is, uh, what has the Code Green campaign been up to since then? What kind of initiatives have you guys got going for, uh, for provider mental health? You know, as with most things, uh, we have a lot of going on and we're just trying to get behind <laughs> one bet. and keep it going. Uh, so, I mean, so the, the story of the back, what, how Code Green started, uh, one of the founding board members, uh, it was in 2014, uh, one of their coworkers had completed suicide, unfortunately. Um, and it was one of those back at the station, everybody starts talking about it and realizing that it was more like, don't show your feelings. It's not okay. You know, yeah. hush, hush, hush. And they kind of sat there and was like, that's frankly kind of weird and dumb to not express how you're feeling at this situation like it's okay to you know to experience a loss it's yeah. okay to have emotion it doesn't have to be immediate family members so um the the initial focus was to you know peer-to-peer -peer support and to get as much you know to tell the story of as many people as possible that have unfortunately had unfortunately passed uh but you know, we all experienced COVID and, and during COVID, we kind of took a time to reset and kind of look at what we were doing and how we were doing things. Um, and there was new new members of the board introduced with different ideas uh, to, to remove any stagnancy. Um, so our, our newer initiative is, uh, and I stole a phrase from Doug Wolfberg from PWW with permission because he's an attorney. I, I did get permission to use this. <laughs> Had to get that disclaimer in, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, yeah I had to. I have to. Um, so he was given a keynote, and I forget where it was, is uh, for the EMS Memorial Bike Ride, which the Co Green supports um, every single year. We have a couple of riders that go in. Um, I said I'd do it as long as it was downhill, but I haven't been able to find that one yet. Um, um, uh, the route out of Tahoe down to Sacramento, if they push you to the top, it's a great ride down, I can tell you. And a great um, view. And a great view, yes, indeed. <laughs> I'm willing to do that one, but uh, so, but so Doug was given a keynote and it was called a name, not red. And somebody had recorded it and put it on Facebook and I had watched it and we were at our annual board meeting and the impact of the, the, the thought of we, we talk about, or we bring into attention to the people that have, that have passed, that have completed suicide or have passed in EMS from medical or accidents, et cetera. Um, and but we'd never talk about the people that didn't. And the thought of, you know, what about the people that did go get help, that did reach out, that did ask for support, or or when somebody offers support because they know that there's something going on, and we don't read their name because they were successful. And that is only has to do with and, and i hate the term of resilience because everybody's sick of that term resilience but th that's more of a testament to what you know getting the message out of it's okay to be upset it's okay to have feelings it's okay to be affected by anything and everything whether it's it's okay to or, not be okay right yeah 100 percent. so our, our it's not just you know break the stigma of it is we we need everybody to learn because there's old guys like myself that i mean 20 years in this industry yeah of, of ems you know i grew up in the the days of you know the more stuff you got on your uniform the better the call was it wasn't yeah. right you know communicable diseases what are those you know everybody has it so you know that's our 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 push now is to get as much education out there to i mean providers we still interact with providers on a regular basis but our focus is to get companies to buy in on it. You know, in California, as an example, mental health um, is a workers' comp issue. And yeah. so if you're experiencing something, it becomes, you know, 
it there's a there's a focus for employers to provide you know tools to help prevent these things or you're never going to prevent it but to to support somebody that's going through it and to make it so our new our main hashtag and i put it on everything uh is a, a name not read that is, that's great that's that's a, an excellent take on it and and by showcasing success stories i think you can give your your uh, uh our public safety professionals a, a template for a way out of the darkness uh, and showing, showing them that there, uh, there is light at the end of the tunnel and uh, there's a way we can heal and move on. So Christine, just sort of coming back to you, you, you talked about the, the individual provider and the, and the person that may be in need, but you have, you are, I know this because I've been on the stage with you, you're doing a lot of education for the employer as well, because the employer kind of gets a little bit nervous and weary of, oh my goodness, what am I letting this person do? And uh, what am I on the hook for? And so how are you educating your employers when, you know, someone wants to be involved either as a, as a recipient or indeed a donor? Well, I think we start where the employer is. People know different things and they know bits and pieces of different things. And, and with 106,000 people on the transplant waiting list, many people have had personal experience with, um, with transplant. So we kind of start where they're, where they are and where the concerns are. And certainly with staffing uh, shortages and um, they want to know how long their employee will be out. Um, can they return to work uh, with light duty? So we make sure that the information, um, so we're not preventing dispensing medical advice by any means, but we give averages. And then when we um, have contact with the hospital. We give more um, direct information about how long one might per a person might be out, what types of light duty. Uh, there's a lot of um, restrictions around lifting for either of uh, kidney or liver donor surgeries. So um, we certainly uh, share that information. But also um, with HR departments, what types of resources can pay wages while somebody is out and different states and locations have different um, allowances. Uh, and then we also work with an organization called Donor Shield, and that reimburses for lost wages or uh, lodging, travel, um, out-of-pocket expenses. So you can't make money on being a donor, but you can be in reimbursed um, so that you have no loss. So we want to remove those obstacles, both for um, employers and employees. And a lot of employers step up and they want to help, especially if they have an employee who needs an organ transplant. Um, and so we want to help them do it the right way. So so often you see somebody who needs a kidney and you, they say, oh, I'm type O, blood type. Um, and we discourage that because... Um, because of what the National Kidney Registry has done with a nationwide matching service, that we don't have to worry about exact matches. As long as someone's healthy enough to be a donor, they could donate on someone's behalf, even mm -hmm. if they're not a direct donor. That's on the kidney side. It's starting to happen on the liver. And you um, get a credit, right? Is that how it works? Yeah, it's actually it's kind of almost like a credit. You get what's called a standard voucher. So if I, um, if Kelly needed a kidney and I wanted to donate on his behalf, but I'm not a match. I could donate to somebody who is my best match and they will match me somewhere because they want to make the best matches. They want to avoid rejection and dependency on anti-rejection drugs. Um, and then I would get a voucher and I would present that to you. And then you get matched with a pool of living donors nationwide. So they're doing um, what hospitals try to do in paired exchange, they call it one by one, but this is sort of a nationwide view of all the people out there who have donors who don't match them, um, as well as people who need uh, organs. So it takes people off the national transplant waiting list for deceased organs, which in Massachusetts, I think the Mass General Hospital is between nine and 11 year wait. Um, there's other parts in the country that are under two years, but it's huge. It's a long wait and people often don't live long enough to see that. So it creates, so we want to help people start searches that are most effective. And we don't want people to self-select and say, oh, I'm not a type O. So I'm sorry, I can't, I can't help, but I wish, I wish them the best. So what we do is try to help employers who often are putting in newsletters and using their social media connections to promote the donor search for their employee. We want to make that an effective search. Um, and we, you know, we want their efforts to be, um, you know, rewarded with success. 
So. And and Christine, how have how have donors, uh, I mean donors rather, how have employers uh, responded to that that kind of outreach? Are they receptive to uh, to what you're you're telling them? Most are. Um, it, it really depends, and you guys know this better than anybody. Every am you know every EMS service is different. Um, Mm -hmm. from size and whether they're public, private, um, you know, hospital based, community based. So, um, you know, different employers have different capacities to help. Um, And some are in with huge facilities. um, And it's harder to manage that. But they're certainly their direct supervisor and their direct company is very supportive. Um, Mm -hmm. Some have gone on to say we will anybody who is an employee in our uh, organization, we will give uh, six weeks uh, paid leave that does not go against crude paid time off if you were going to be a donor for um, for this particular recipient. So awesome. people have really stepped up and um, made it a priority. Now, part two of this goes to RJ. Um, you know, organ donation is, is an altruistic uh, um, gesture, fairly easy sell, I would think, to to employers to support such a thing. On the other hand, our stigma against provider mental illness has always stood in the way. And, and, and it seems like even today, knowing what we know, that many employers and many of our peers still think of, of people with, with mental health issues, PTSD, depression, that sort of thing as damaged goods. Um, how much pushback do you have, uh, RJ, among employers at providing better mental health services and and shifting the 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 paradigm, the way they look at their most valuable resource, their employees, uh, when they're crying out for uh, for help with the illnesses that we can't see. Right, mm-hmm. and, and and that's actually the that last part you just said that the part that we can't see is it's one of those tough cells. Uh, so I, th- there's been a few employers that I have I've worked with that have been very have received it very well and, and been very welcoming and but the reason they are is because it, it's a result of something that has happened within their organization yeah. uh, so it's always been reactionary for for most um and there's a few employers that i have seen that are, are starting a you know the peer support groups uh, there's an employer actually here in california that uh, i know he has a, a, a here they call him uh LMFTs, licensed mental health family therapist, um, on staff, and that individual's job is to help facilitate peer groups or okay. help getting somebody some sort of resources and stuff like that. But still, because it's the the unknown, you can't see, you can't necessarily test for it, um, and things like that. Employers are not so willing to try something. I mean, they all say, "Oh, well, we have an EAP program, the Employee Assist Program." Um, I was made aware of a, an instance, um, I think it was last year or the year before, um, where an organization uh, had a, an unfortunate death, um, and that person's partner was very affected by it, because I believe they, they were witness to what took place. And they they used the EAP, and they said, well, absolutely, she needs it. Uh, we'll get somebody to her in you know three or four days. And it's like that person doesn't that's, it, that's three too ways late. is not <laughs> right. Um, and you know, we were able to connect somebody out of state that was able to do kind of a a risk assessment to just make sure that there was an yeah. immediate threat um, for that person. But the employers are still uh, it's the new, as they always say, the new back injury, you know, yeah, that you know, and and EAPs are often programs are often capped at five, six visits, uh, and, and the counselors, uh, quite often have no concept of the pressures and, and, uh, uh, obstacles we face as public safety and health professionals. Uh, um, they, they don't quite get our mindset. Uh, and, and that always continues to be a problem as, as well. Um, so yeah, we're the, the, when when I was with Code Green campaign, I, we were we'd say that you know we're crowdsourcing peer support because that's where the rubber meets the road, uh, and there's nothing like the person sitting 18 inches away from you being your best avenue of support and your peer counselor. Um, we always say that we we'd have our partners back in a fight, but what about if the fight is with the the demons in their own head? Um, right, do we right. have their back then? And we should. 
Um, so it's uh, I applaud you for continuing that that push to get employers to recognize the mental and emotional and psychological stresses we undergo and provide support for them. I was just going to, you made a great point of the, the, you know, talking to these therapists, there's another initiative we have is we're trying to create competent, culturally competent clinicians, because, you know, everybody, uh, I happen to be married to a clinical psychologist who was an EMT. Um, so I, I have the double-edged sword basically. Uh, but for, Everybody will say, I can handle, I've worked with PTSD, I've worked with depression. They might have on a superficial level, but people of of our industry, whether it's police, fire, private EMS, you know, municipality, we have that dark humor. We have that dark side that it's mm-hmm. really, really tough to break that, that shell. Uh, and yeah. it's kind of like, if you're going to be a, if you're a bilingual person and you're doing it as a job, you know, they make you be culturally competent to the language that you speak. So you may just know Spanish, yeah. but do you know the dialect of where I'm in Southern California? So it's more of a Mexican dialect. Um, are you culturally competent to that? Because the words yeah. might, you might think mean the same in, in a definition, but they don't mean the same in that mm-hmm. culture. Um, so we're our new provider list that we're, we're, we're selecting is we're going through and making sure um that they are culturally competent to what we are awesome. experiencing. And I was going to talk about your websites in a second, uh, but before we do that, Kelly, of course, coming up next week, we have no mid show read, but uh, coming up next week, we are going to be live. Uh, they're letting us go live. They're opening the gate. You, me, and Chris is back, of course. And uh, we're excited to welcome uh, Ed Rock and uh, Rhonda Kelly. And uh, we're going to con- actually continue awesome. the pretty much continue the conversation. So I'm looking forward to that. We, I won't be able to drop any F bombs or anything like that. So, um, you know. no, we won't be talking about finance, Kelly. No, we won't be talking about that <laughs> at all. Um, I spent some time before we got on here, and your websites are both very, very comprehensive. Uh, there's a number of resources. Uh, RJ, I see you also, and it's one of those unfortunate things, but I think we have to talk about it that you are supporting a uh, suicide register. And uh, it's it's a sad state to have to state this. Uh, but of course, you you have those resources on the website. Yeah, we do. We do have a we we partner with the Firefighter Behavioral Health Alliance. Um, the we have on our website, you have the ability to uh, submit information anonymously of uh, somebody that has that has unfortunately has passed. Um, and the Fire, Firefighter Behavioral Health Alliance, they're the ones that they maintain these statistics, they maintain the database, and uh, provide you know information to. Oh. Uh, people that are looking for statistical data uh, on this. Uh, and there's, I believe actually, Rob, don't you sub- maintain a database as well of some sort? Um, I'm well, I'm actually working along with our colleagues at NHTSA and we're looking at the line of duty death um, mm-hmm. database across uh, first responders. Um, and, and it's sort of similar, but probably not the same, if you see what I mean. That, is, that has always one of the, been one of the biggest obstacles is uh, aside from Firefighter Behavioral Health Alliance and and now Code Green, no one was tracking this. No right. one right. knew how many of our brethren took their own lives unless someone reached out and reported it or it, you know, said so in an obituary. And, and we still don't know how many die in quote unquote accidents or extreme sports things were that were actually, you know, uh risk seeking behavior mm-hmm. because they're you know they 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 were depressed or or suffering from PTSD. So it's hard to do good work if you don't have the statistics, and and that's right. another uh, crucial initiative you guys are doing. Uh, Christine, so one of the things that I picked out of your website, of course, is and this is kind of call to action time because we've talked about you know there are people that are in need, our our, co- our colleagues, our, our brothers and sisters in public safety. Um, so why don't you use this as an opportunity just to to uh, highlight to uh, the, the, the cases that you are currently looking after? So we have four active donor searches. Um, the first is for Kelly Raymond and her husband is a firefighter EMT. Um, and so uh, when your spouse is a firefighter EMT, you're EMS, you're a first responder too, by, uh, by extension. So um, Kelly uh, needs a kidney and we have been, she's actually, her husband, Dave, was the first person I met when I started this job. They were already active in their search and they've had a couple of 
close calls about finding a donor, but it didn't work out. Um, but uh, Kelly is um, diabetic um, and she, in 2013, she lost her leg to diabetes and now di diabetes has really taken a toll on her kidneys. So she does dialysis every day, several times a day. Um, and she's really waiting for a donor. Um, that's her best chance of survival for sure. We uh, did a campaign um, where we had billboards up throughout New England and then the uh, local news picked up the billboard story. And so we did get about 90 um, inquiries. Uh, that boils down to about 10% on a good day. So um, we do have about seven or eight people testing for her. And we're really hopeful. Wonderful. Several, several of them are um, either EMS or firefighters. Um, we also have um, Reed Capel. He's an EMT in New Jersey. And uh he works for Atlantic Health. He goes to work every day in the morning and he does dialysis in the afternoon. Uh, during COVID, they pulled him off Jeez. the road because, yeah, um, it was too and, high. And risk. Let me just jump in. We did an interview way back when uh, on, on, on my podcast, and we'll stick that in the show notes because uh, he's quite a live wire, uh, despite all the things he's got going on. Uh, he, and again, you know, the energy that he, he has is, is infectious. But of course, Reed needs help and we need to help Reed. He plugs away and he is the most positive guy ever. He's like, today's going to be a good day and I'm feeling it. This is my year. And he goes to dialysis every day and sits next to a man who's been on dialysis for nine years. Um, and then he goes to work the next morning. Um, he's in logistics now. He's off the road because of the high risk nature because of COVID. Um, but uh, he's still, he plugs away. We had him at a New Jersey Devils game. On March 12th, um, it was First Responder Appreciation Day, and he's a big Devils fan. And they got him on the Jumbotron with his poster. Um, and we've had a couple of inquiries from that. Um, Wonderful. Which is fantastic. We also have Paula Bateman. She's the wife of a firefighter EMT um, as well. She needs a liver. And uh, we did a campaign. Our sponsors, Prodigy MS, um, has been very generous in helping us get out the word um, and we actually put out an email um, just through their their emailing list. We used just New England because for liver donors, you need to be closer. It can't really be a nationwide search because you have to travel. And we have some people testing for Paula now, too, which is fantastic. And I just today added uh, Dave Gallagher. He is a paramedic supervisor for Schaller Hampton EMS in Pittsburgh. And he uh, also needs a kidney. And we are going to promote his search at EMS Update this week uh, coming up. We're going to put flyers in the uh, conference packets and uh, hopefully get some announcements. And he's been so reluctant to ask for help, but um, he's letting us push him down the road, I think, with the encouragement of his wife of 27 years. So we just started his search and he's going to really need some support. Well, I'm just standing in here, but Chris and Kelly have a ton of followers, right, Kelly? So hopefully the message yes. will get spread. Yeah. Yes. So if you go to our yeah. website, um, it's right on the upper right corner. You can see donor searches and each of them have a page. It tells their stories. It tells you can click and um, it actually goes to me. Um, so if you inquire, it comes to me and then I call you up or send you an email, whatever you prefer, and give you information. And then we can sort of strategize whether you're a local to um, the person you want to help and how to best do that and to answer your questions. It doesn't, there's no commitment to inquire. And, and therein lies our call to action, folks. You've, you've just heard from representatives of two uh, organizations dedicated to the physical and emotional wellness of EMS uh, and public safety providers. And you have four people who are looking for donors. Uh, we got into EMS because we wanted to help people. And what better way to do that than to help one of our brethren in need. So reach out to EMS Gives Life. Uh, look up those donors. And if you're of a mind to uh, be a living organ donor, please reach out to Christine. And for RJ, uh, representative of uh, the Code Green campaign, um, reach out to them uh, for, for resources on being a peer support uh, person uh, or how you can lobby your employer to increase mental health benefits for their employees. And for myself, my co-host Chris, uh, Chris Civilero, <laughs> Boy, you're a lot better looking than Chris Aguilero, Rob, and I, I want to apologize for insulting you by calling you that. But uh, for myself and co-host Rob Lawrence, our international correspondents this week, and 
Christine and RJ, thanks for tuning in to Inside EMS. We're going to catch you guys next week. <laughs>